on a bit. And we can continue from where we left off. Um, the recordings are uploaded on YouTube, on um, on here. So I just want to show you those who don't know where to find them. Actually, let's do it this way. Um, can I share my entire screen now? <clears throat> oh. So most of you joined the team from your lecturer site. So if you are in this, when you go to recordings, all the record, uh, when you click on the recordings there, you should be able to see all the recordings for all my sessions. Like there are 34 recordings, oh, 35. But the, here is your exam prep um, part one that we did earlier today. Uh, I will also upload the other one. You will be able to see it from there. Those in my group, you also have the same access because those who are linked to my group, you also have the same recordings uh, because the link is the same. Otherwise, those who did not join Teams and they are not in my group, the recordings are on YouTube. I, I, can't, I, I can't go to YouTube and show you where to find it. Just Google my name. Elizabeth Lizzie Boy, you will find my channel. Look for the channel called STA 21Y. Uh -uh. Look for my channel and look for a playlist for this group, the same group as my tutorial group. That's where you will find all the recordings, which are the same as these ones that are uploaded here. They are the same as the ones that are uploaded everywhere else. Okay, so going on and <clears throat> since I don't want to share my entire screen, we go back to sharing only what we require or what we will need. <clears throat> okay. So we ended up on this question. Let's see. Did we do that? Yeah, we did part 11. Now we are on part 12. So part 12, uh, we done with discrete probabilities. Now, the other thing I want to also mention before we move, because on this mock exam paper, they only included binomial and Poisson. Sometimes they will include discrete probabilities. Remember a discrete probability, how will you recognize that? You will see that by them giving you a table with the X observation and the probabilities. That you need to remember that that is also discrete probabilities and you can also apply the same information as that. Uh, the greater than or less than and so forth. The other thing you need to also remember is how to calculate the expected mean for the discrete probabilities, which is your the sum of your x times your corresponding probabilities and how to calculate the variance or the standard deviation. I'm not going to do the variance because the variance is the square root. The variance is the uh, the square of your of your standard deviation. So here you will have your sum of your x observation minus the expected mean because we would have calculated the expected mean squared divide, ah, no, I'm lying, uh, sorry, no dividing, multiply by the, multiply by the corresponding probabilities. But you will remember that the, if you, if you are lost and you don't know which formula to use, remember the, this document that we, we use in for the tables, it has, it has formulas, so you, you can go any wrong or any way wrong. So those formulas are also included in some of this. And you will also make use of the note. Remember the summary notes that you need to prepare between now and before you go write the exam, which you don't have enough time. Uh, make sure that you collate all that information, including those formulas. Okay, so moving on. Let's look at part 
12, which is normal distribution. Why do I see a normal distribution here? It's because I can already recognize I've moved from calculating probability of Poisson or binomial, and here they are mentioning things like the mean and the standard deviation. So, <clears throat> part seven, they are asking what is the probability that a random, uh, that randomly chosen recipient will receive a payout of at least, um, at least 2,400. Now with normal distribution, also remember the following. The sign matters. If the sign is greater than or less than, the probability you find on the table, it will be that probability that you are looking for. If the sign is greater than or equal or greater than, we're going to find the probability by using Z minus the value you see on the table. If it's between, maybe I'm not also doing it right for you, so let's, let's do it the correct way, the way I'm used to doing it. If you find the probability of Z less than a value, then the value you find on the table will be that probability. If you are given the probability of Z greater than a value of Z, uh, usually, I, I, I see on your on on some of the questions that have been posting on WhatsApp, they use a small z, a small z. So I'm gonna use the small z so that you can understand that. Um, so the probability that z score is less than or equals to the z value, uh, you find it on the table. The probability that your z is greater than a z value, you will find it by using one mi minus the probability you find on the table. And if you find that it lies between, your z lies between two values, small z1 and small z2, two values, then we're going to find the probability of z less than small z2 minus the probability of z less than small z1. I hope you are able to see that. So it means we're going to find the probability of the second z value minus the probability of the uh, first z, z value. It's because this one will have the bigger probability value and this is always has a smaller probability value. Okay, so that is how you're going to answer all the, the questions relating to um, normal distribution. From here on, going forward, until we do hypothesis testing, that you need to always remember. Okay, so now we need to find the probability that X, which is the payout, X, it's greater than or equals to 2,460. That's what they want you to calculate. So you can either do it inside or you can just go and find the probability. The probability that Z is greater than or equals to X minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Information is given to you there, so you need to go and calculate the probability that z is greater than or equals to our x value is always the one that is given on the question. So it will be 2460 minus the mean is 3000. Am I recording? I forgot. Yes, yes. you are. Yes, yes. you are. Yes, Thank you. yes it's recording. Three seven three three zero divided by the standard deviation of a thousand. So now go ahead and calculate since you guys have calculators and give me the values. Negative one comma two seven. Negative one comma two seven. Negative one comma two seven. Okay, so now we need to go to the table, but 
we cannot go to the table with a greater than. We need to go to one minus the value we're going to find on the table because the table contains the less than values. So I'm just going to use less than. The table contains the less than values. So we are going to use the Z value that we have here and go to the table. So going to the table, we go to the Z table on the negative side of the table. With Z negative. We're looking for 1,27. 1,27. And then we need to go to the top. And let's do this. Go to the top and look for 7 at the end. And that is the value we're going to use, which is 0, 0,12. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0,102. So you're going to say 1 minus 0, 0,102. 0. And you can just let me know what is the answer. 0,898. Which is which is E. And that's how you answer the normal distribution probabilities. Uh, sorry, can I just ask? <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, the sign changed uh, from a D to a I'm sorry to hear me. Sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Um, yeah, I'm saying that the sign change from at least to at most. Okay. By the end. Um, not necessarily, but yes, I've changed the sign because on the table, you're always going to find those probabilities, the probability of a less than. You're not going to find the probability of a greater than. That is why we do a complement of this value which then a complement will be a less than. And the table, the Z value table, this table only contains the probability of a less than. Contains all that. Even when you go to the positive side, it's all the probability of a less than. And you can also see from here, when I was doing this one as well, you can see that I'm going to the probability of a less than, probability of a less than as well. Whereas on this side, it was Z, uh, Z1 is greater than Z. And the side changed now. Okay. Now, this one, um, okay, so on this one, now let's go back to this one. Oh, that you just did. Can you, say, can you please mute yourself because I muted you and then you unmuted. Okay. Let's go back to this one now. Remember what we did here. We went to the table to go find this probability. This probability of 0, 0,89. But we actually went to on the table to find that probability. So we went to say the probability of Z less than minus 1, 
minus 1.27 is equals to 0, 0,1020. Now, if I remove this value and I put Z here, or small Z, let's make use of the same. If I put a small Z there, it tells me that the value of Z that I find here help me to find this probability. So the same way I can take this probability because we went and found it by using the Z value, we can use this probability to go outside to go find the Z values. And that is what is required of you to answer this next question. Suppose that a Z value is less than, and since because it's less than, remember, any probability of a less than, the value you see on the table is that value. If it was greater than, we would have done one minus the value we see as an answer there. So this says, go to the table, find this probability on the table. Then once you have that probability on the table, go out and go find the corresponding Z values. And that is what we are looking for. Zero comma two six minus zero comma two six. So it means yes, it means we need to come on here and look for any value that is close by. So if you look at these two values, which is very difficult to because they are both stating differences away or, or same or more similar. Um so if you look at your answers here as well, they have them as three digit numbers, but we know that our Z value is only two decimal numbers. But based on those two values that are close, we, you can choose one or the other. Just look at the examples. If they gave you a Z value and they only gave you uh, th uh, two de uh, digits or two decimals, then I would say you choose the one that is close by, whether it's six or it's five. So if I look at this, let's say I'm taking any one of those, so they correspond to negative 0 0.2, and if I go to the top, it corresponds with 0.5, so it's negative. Lizzie? Yes. Uh, let me. Okay, can I just come in there? What I did was, I took both the the the, the, the I took both of them and added them so that I can get the two point five five. Because if you if you add, uh, let me let me go to my table. If you add. Um, so you added both of them and divided by two. Yes. Which is the same as just getting 0 0.255 because it's halfway between the two. It's like one of those. Yes. You remember when you do the critical value, there is one where it is 1,45. You 1,645. It's one of those exceptions that you can also do on this one as well. Yes. So the answer will be zero comma, and it's on the negative side of thing, negative negative side of the table. So you must also remember to keep the negative value as well. So the answer is E. There was nothing necessary for you to calculate anything. The only thing you needed to do is recognize that this is the probability. Come to the table, look for that probability inside the table and go out to look for the probability that you are looking for. That's all what you need to do. Okay, moving on to number 14. Consider once again the UIF coronavirus, blah, 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 with the mean of 
3,730 and the standard deviation of 1,000. Suppose furthermore, a random sample of 10,000 recipients were selected. Calculate the standard error. What is the standard error? Is your standard deviation divided by the square root of n? Sorry, Lizzie. Yebo? I'm so sorry. I just wanted to do a follow up question, especially on the last order from the from the previous. Yes, especially I, I, I came across with this question similar to this one, but mm -hmm. the, the statement was reading at as it at most uh, at most zero point six. It's the same as this. Remember, at most is less than or equal. When we deal with probabilities, this less than or equal doesn't really matter. What's important is it's less than. You can either use the less than or equal or less than. The same way as, yeah, at least it really doesn't matter. For when we calculate the probabilities, we don't even need to even worry about the equality sign. Even when it says at least, um, okay. so you can always ignore that. But on, this is only only for normal distribution probabilities, whether you do in sampling distribution or when you get to the hypothesis testing, or when you do in this um, uh, normal distribution chapter six or study unit six. Only then, when you do discrete probabilities, the sign is very important. You must also consider that. Okay. So okay. if it says Can at we... most, yeah, if it says at most, it's less than or equal, so it's the same as less than, you treat it the same way as this. If they would have said at least. Yes, okay. Then yeah, you would, you would have taken this number, the value, one minus 0 0.4, and you will get 0 0,6 and then you use this to go to the table to go find it because if the site the the wedding was saying at least it means the answer that they would have get gotten here they did one minus the value you found on the table and it gave you that answer it will be the same as what we did here uh, so in this instance where the probability of z it's greater than or equals to minus 1,27, that probability is 0, 0,8980. But in order for us to find this probability, we actually had to go and find the probability of less than that. So you just need to make sure that you know how to apply all these rules when you're working with normal distribution probabilities. How to move back and forth, how to move from, from this from getting an answer of a probability by using the sign to using the table and so forth. Okay, now coming yep. back to our number 14. Uh, sorry, that error. Elizabeth? Yes. I'm sorry to to disturb. Um, all, part thirteen is only um showing on my screen now, so I I can't really recall how we solved that one because I've seen it before and I I remember that I had trouble solving this very same thing. So can you keep quickly just recap? Yeah, I haven't been seeing this page. It's the first time I'm seeing it, but I've been hearing you speaking about it. So if you could just quickly recap on how we could solve solve this. I'm sorry to take you back. Solving this, we go, yeah, we find the values on the table where it's closer to 0, 0,4. You go find the probability, the Z value, so it's 0, 0,2. But because those two values, we cannot decide, it will be between the two of them, so it's halfway. So 5 plus 5 divided by 2, it's 5.5, 5. it's 55. So we just use the same, 0, 0.255. Mm. 
and that's how we got the answer of negative 0 0.25. Okay. Coming back to 14, it seems as if like 14 doesn't want to come. Okay, how do we, oh, not how do we, because I already showed you the formula. So, substitute your standard deviation of a thousand. Divide that by the square root of 10,000. And what do we get? 10. 10. And the answer is 10, which is C. Fifteen with confidence intervals, there are three things that can happen. Confidence interval for the mean when the population standard deviation is known, or when the population standard deviation is unknown, or for the proportion. You need to be able to identify those things when you read the question. Are you given sigma or population standard deviation? Are you given S, which is the sample standard deviation? Or are you given the proportion? Are you given the proportion? Um, so you need to be able to identify those things. Because to find the critical value, if the population standard deviation is known, we're going to use the Z critical value. If the sum, uh, sample standard deviation is given, therefore the population standard deviation is unknown, we're going to use T. For the proportion, we always use the Z value. You always need to remember those things. And when you go and find the critical value, always divide your critical value by two. For confidence interval, whether they ask you to find the upper limit or the lower limit, always divide by two, your critical value. Okay, so in terms of this question, you need to go find the critical value at 95% confidence interval. Because they have given you also, you need to take into consideration the statements that they are giving you as well. You are given the sample standard deviation, so it means the critical value will find it on the T table. Ne? So you will use T, alpha divided by two, and the degrees of freedom, which is N minus one. Always remember that. And now let's go find the critical value. Alpha, do you, st do you remember how to find your alpha value from a confidence level? So a com if a confidence level is one minus alpha, which is 0 0.95, to find the value of alpha, you can just say alpha is equals to minus one plus 0 0.95. I'm applying maths and I'm going to assume that you all know maths. And we can multiply throughout by a negative number. Therefore, this will be um, alpha and negative will be positive and ne ne positive will become negative 0 0.95. And this is equals to 0 0.05. I didn't have to do all these steps anyway. I didn't have to. Okay, so our alpha value is 0 0.05. So our T of 0 0.05 divided by 2 and the degrees of freedom of 70 minus 1.
Just give me a sec, just to erase all these things that I wrote. It's gonna take longer. Okay, so therefore our critical value here will be T, 0, 0,05 divided by 2 is 0, 0,025. I'm just gonna put the zero there and this will be 69. So we need to go to the T table and go look for 0, 0,025 and 69 degrees of freedom. Looking for the T table. Go look for T distribution table. You can find it anyway on your table. Okay, so the other thing with the T table as well, depending on where you're finding your T table, it's very important that you standardize your tables as well. Um, and I saw that your lecture said you can use your study guide or something like that. What did they say? You must use them. So in the study guide also study is guide. a three decimal study guide, ne? So it's yes. three decimals. So we need to you need to use the one that has three decimals. Okay. So we go and find our alpha divided by two, which was zero comma zero two five, and we need to look for uh, sixty nine. So I just want to remember that column. Okay, so we are on the next page. We're looking for 69. And there is 69 and where they both meet. One comma, 995. That is our critical value. One comma, nine, nine. How many nines? Nine, five. Two. Okay, so that is a critical value. That's not the answer that we're looking for. We need to calculate the confidence. So calculating the confidence interval, we use point estimate plus or minus the critical value times the standard error, which will be the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n, which is times the standard error. So we just need to substitute the values we are given. Our sample mean is 3,730 plus or minus our critical value. We did go find it. It was 1,995. Your standard deviation is 1,000 divided by the square root of your sample size which is 70. Now you can go ahead and calculate. Calculate this side first. When I mean this side, I mean only that part. Just give me the value of that. You get 238,4481. Two? 238,4481. Two three eight comma four four eight one. Am I did I hear you right? That's correct. Cool. Now we need to create our upper limit and our lower limits. So you can take three seven three zero. You need to be very careful with this. You need to have your lower limit is where the negative sign is at. So 3730 minus, let's make this bigger, 3730 minus 238,4481 and 3730 plus 2. 38.4481. Sorry for my handwriting. Now, which one? Option five. E. 
do this one. Three four nine two, comma three nine six eight. Is that what you are telling me? So that is option E. Mm -hmm. Happiness. Yes. Yes. Next one. Now, how would you know whether are you doing the population, uh, the confidence interval for the mean or for the proportion? For the mean, you will be given things like the mean and the standard deviation. If we look at this question, are you given the mean and the standard deviation? It also says construct the confidence interval. So when you read the question, you should be able to identify what are you given. So this is for the proportion. What are you given with the proportion? You are given N and you are given the observation that satisfies some sample proportion somewhere. So with the population proportion as well, sometimes you will not be given the population proportion but you will be given or you need to use the point estimate so the sample proportion but you might not be given the sample proportion you will be given observation that satisfy that sample divide by and your sample size then you can calculate your sample proportion because you will need the sample proportion to calculate or to construct your confidence interval which is that alpha divided by two times the standard error. You need to use that formula. So, what is your sample proportion? 0, 0,4. 0, 0,4. Which is 80 divided by 200. 200. Which is equals to 0, 0,4. We're not that. We also need to find the critical value. Yeah, we need to go to the Z table. So Z of alpha divided by two. Now, what is our alpha value of 99% confidence level? Alpha is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and that will be 0, 0, how many zeros? Two zeros? Two of the decimal one. Okay. Eh? Huh? Uh, it's like uh, something. Uh, uh, something. Okay. So, we need to go to the table. Now we need to go to the Z table. So this is the probability. This value you see here is your probability. Or uh, if you go to, I'm, I'm not even sure now. I think when we were doing the confidence interval, we did have a, 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 a table that has the confidence levels. For yes, your you gave us a table. Yes, you gave us a table. Well, tomorrow, tomorrow, that table should become very handy for you to use because then you need to take this value, go to the table, to the Z table. It's going to be time consuming, whereas you have the information in front of you, you can use that. So you need to come inside this table, look for a value called 0, 0,005. So 0, 0,005. 0, 0, Five should be somewhere here. Uh, I can use this one, it's the one where it says 49. So I'm going to take negative 2,58. But I also know that that is the Z score. So that will be negative. Oh, sorry. 
that is 2,58. I don't even have to worry about the negative value that is there. So I can just take that as my Z value. So you just come here and take the closest value. Even this one is close, but I know that the critical value is 2,58. So that is why I'm choosing the 2,58. So now I have my critical value. I have my proportion, uh, my point estimate. So I can just substitute 0, 0,4 plus or minus 2,58 square root of 0, 0,4 times 1 minus 0, 0,4 divided by our n is 200. Also similar, you just go and calculate the values. You can do step by step. If you don't know how to use your cash flow calculator, the fraction one you can you can do this step by step but if you know how to use your 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 cash your calculator you just use the same so when you get to this one you can put it into the bracket so you just say 0 comma 4 um, and then you start with the minus first uh, minus 2 comma 5 8 open bracket square root or you can say multiply by or you can open bracket, square root, put the square root sign and then put the fraction button and then do 0, 0,4, open bracket, 1 minus 0, 0,4, close bracket, and then go to the bottom and put 200. Then go to the outside and put the bracket and then answer the negative side of things and then answer the positive side of things. What do you get? Which option? Option A. A. Option A. Option A. Those who don't know, speak now or forever. You won't understand. Because... Okay, okay, Elizabeth. Yes. Uh, so can I use level of confidence on page on study guide on page hundred and fifty eight? So if I don't if I don't have to go page? long yes, process. Wait. Yes, let's see where Hun page hundred. 158. 158. Yes. Mm. Where am I now? Yo, I'm still low. Wait, 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 wait. Where is... 158. Oh, there we go. 158. There we go. Yeah. Yes. This is the same table that we shared in the Yes, you can use this because okay. there it is where alpha for a 99% confidence in confidence level. Okay. You can just come okay. here and use this. So when we get to when we get to the hypothesis testing, then this we can also use this. Uh, actually, they should have just did it like this without that. It's an error. Because it's a one thing, one thing we don't divide by two. <clears throat> yes, you can use this definitely. So make note. Thank you. Make note. Okay. Make note. Or you can even write it somewhere on your summary notes. Okay. Now. We are in somewhere on the borderline, I think. Now we are in hypothesis testing. Why do I know that we are in an hypothesis testing? It's because they mention things like one-sided lower tail. In confidence interval, we don't talk about the one-sided. We talk about upper limit and lower limit. So. The minute they mention things like this, you must know that now it's hypothesis testing. With hypothesis testing, we do both uh, two tail test or one tail test. Okay, so. So 
suppose that the calculated test statistic is one sided tail test in the lower side, which is in the negative side. It is minus 2,82. Suppose further that the population standard deviation is known. So if the population standard deviation is known, the test statistic that would, they would have calculated would have been there. Is it T or Z? Z. Would have been a Z. Z. So therefore it means this value corresponds to negative 2.82. Now, they say in the lower tail area, uh, since they say in the lower tail area, we can also assume that it is less than. So, which makes things easier for us. Because the question they're asking us is, what is the p-value? Now, finding the p-value also is determined by the side you use the greater than it means we will say one minus the value you find on the table and so forth and because this side says it's a lower tail area which is the less than value, uh, less than tail area which is in the negative so we can go to the negative side of the table and look for negative two comma a2 because we're looking for the p value and the p value we must always remember that this is a proba P value is a probability. So use the Z value. Z value of 2,82. Negative 2,82. Negative 2,0024. Which is that. Yes. Which is option number C. Easy, ne? Okay, so if it was said it's two sided, so how how do you how do you solve that question if it is two sided? If it's two sided, we multiply, or you can add zero comma zero or zero comma zero zero two four plus zero comma zero zero. Two, four. If it's only for two sided, for two sided test, two sided test, we multiply the p value, the value we find on the table by two because there are two sides. Uh, we take into consideration that there is that side and this side. We take both of them. For a one-sided test, we only look at one, one value. Okay. Number 18. Also remember, when we talk about hypothesis testing, you need to know all six steps of hypothesis testing. Remember them. Stating the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. You need to be able to state them correctly. Remember that the null hypothesis, we do not use the sample statistic, we use the population parameters. Also, the null hypothesis always has an equal sign. So it can either be less than or equal, greater than or equal, or equal. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. You can also just leave it as an equal sign. What matters the most is the sign that you allocate to your alternative hypothesis. You need to remember that, that the sign you place on your alternative hypothesis will tell you whether you're doing a one-tail test and whether is it an upper tail area or a lower tail area, or whether you're doing a two tail test. That is very important because if it's a two tail test, then it's a not equal. If it's a lower side area, it's a less than. If it's an upper side area, it is a greater than. And all those things, they affect how you find your critical value, how you find your p-value, how you make a decision. 
So it's very important to know how to state the null hypothesis. So it means you also need to know how to find the critical value and how to calculate the test statistic and how to make a decision. So those are the hypothesis testing things that you need to know. So for example, like this question where they asked all six steps of hypothesis as options. So we need to find the incorrect statement. So we, get, we can go through each statement um, one by one. So number A, you will tell me whether is that statement is correct or incorrect, but we will do all of them. Number A, there is a 5% level of significance. Look at that. Correct. Correct. That is correct. 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 All right. This test is a one-sided test. Look at True. the whole statement. Correct. It is a because it's more than a thousand. So that is correct. The critical value is 1,645. Now, ask yourself, what am I given here? We are given the population standard deviation. So therefore, it means you're going to use Z. And are you going to divide Z by alpha or just the Z? Just Z. It's just a Z alpha, right? So it will just be Z alpha. And we can go to our study, our our guide. So let's go back there. We are given our alpha of 0, 0,05. So therefore, it means Z of 0, 0,05. And a Z of 0, 0,05 is the same as a 95% confidence level. Ne? So coming here, you also need to remember to put here alpha value because they didn't give you your alpha value. So just give it that way. 0, 0,05. So that you extend this table a little bit just to give you assistance. So we're looking for 0, 0,05 or 95%. So let's go there. One sided test or one tail test, it's 1.645. So that is also correct, right? Number D. The alternative hypothesis is that the average cost of a low-end smartphone is more than a thousand. Incorrect. Hmm? Correct. Incorrect. Correct. It's correct. It's correct. It can be correct because, because the null hypothesis the null hypothesis states that. So the null hypothesis can be the same as the alternative. No. But remember, in the null hypothesis, you can never have an a null hypothesis. You always have an equal sign. And if the statement from the researcher says more than, and a more than is a greater than, so that cannot be in a null hypothesis. So your null hypothesis will state that the mean it's greater than or equals to a thousand and the alternative will state what the researcher wants to prove because that's what can only go into the alternative because in the alternative the statement should not have an equal sign to it you can state it in that way or you can even just ignore that and just put an equal sign there it will still be fine but you must always remember that your null hypothesis, in your null hypothesis, there is always an equal sign. In an alternative hypothesis, there is no equal, no equal sign. So the signs that you can put on, the sign that you can put on your null hypothesis are equal, less than or equal, greater than or equal. The signs that you can put on the alternative is not equal, it's less than or it's more than. 
or greater than. So those are the only signs you can put. So this is also correct. Now, the last one says you need to find the test statistic. So yeah, it means we need to do some calculations. So you need to calculate your Z value, your Z score. Z is equals to the sample mean. Let me clean it nicely because all these inks are still there. So we have Z is equals to our X minus the mean divide by the standard deviation, divide by the square root of n. Our x is that state, um, it's always, oh sorry, actually our x is our x bar, because it's the sample mean. This is the population mean because it's the one that is stated in the hypothesis testing. The sample mean is 1,200 minus 1,000 divide by standard deviation of 800 divide by the square root of n is 100. In the exam, I'm also going to show you shortcuts as well. In the exam, you don't have to go and calculate this because I can see already there it says it's negative. The answer you get at the top determines the sign as well. So if it was 1,000 minus 200, then I will say continue working out. But because the answer you get at the top will be 1,200 minus 1,000, you get a positive answer there at the top. You can just then determine that this is the incorrect value. But just go ahead and calculate the test statistic. That is for tomorrow when you write the exam. <laughs> Um, I get 2.5. 2.5. So this is the incorrect yes. one because that is negative 2.5. Lizzie, it's Calvin. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, tell me if it was uh less than, the answer will be correct. Né? If it was less than a uh, thousand. The, null, the alternative hypothesis is if it was less than 1,000, that means the test statistics were supposed to be negative. Am I correct? No. It doesn't really matter. The sign, the sign when it comes to the test statistic, it doesn't matter. Uh, you only need to know about the sign for finding the critical value and making the decision and finding the p-value and determining whether you're doing a one-sided test or a two-sided, a two-tailed test. The test statistic, whether the answer we get here is negative or positive, whether the sign was greater than or not equal, or it really doesn't matter. It will not influence the answer you get. It influences how you use that answer. Okay. Okay, thanks. Nineteen. A two-sided hypothesis testing for the mean is a known population standard deviation. Well, with a known population standard deviation yields a p-value of 0 0.03. Th things are uh, highlighted in bold just to give you an indication of what you need to look out for. Two-sided test, known, population standard deviation, then it means this is the Z value. We can use the p-value. Yields a p-value of 0, 0,03. It's a two-sided test. So if it yields a p-value of 0, 0,03, therefore it means this p-value is divided into those two parts. So it means in order for them to find that p-value, 
this side was 0, 0,015 and this side is 0, 0,015. Because both of them will be equals to 0, 0,003. That's what is happening. Which one of the following statement is incorrect? Okay. Now. There are a couple of things that you need to also take into consideration as well. Number A, it says the test statistic is 1,85. So what is 1,85? We need to round it off to two decimals because our Z value needs only, we need only two, we need only two decimal places, right? So this is 1,89. So we need to take this 1,89. Let's go to the table. Now, the other thing you need to take into consideration when we look at the p-value on the table, if the z-value is positive, then when if the z only when the, when we do the 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 p value if the z value is positive then we're going to say the value we find on the table we're going to minus that value from one so we need to go and find that probability and subtract it from one so let's go we're looking for one comma eight nine on the positive side, we go look for 1,8 and 9 is the last column. And that is the value we are looking for. So that is 0, 0,9706. I think on this question actually as well, so, but anyway, let me not preempt the answer. Let's go 0, comma, what did we get? 0, comma, 9706. And the answer you get is? 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Two Sorry, Miss Liz, why are we doing 1.89? Why are we doing 1.89? It's because yes. we need to we need to use remember we are given we what the, the p value is. We have to go to the z value table. Yeah. Uh we need to round it up. So okay. because on the z value table we only have two decimals. So the value to the left or to the right is greater than or equals to five, we add one. So we I added one to that. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. So if you look at this, you can see that it doesn't even correspond to any of the answers that we have. So number um, A is the incorrect one because it should be either 0, 0,3 or actually it should be 0, 0,015 because then we need to sorry, multiply Lizzie. to get to that. Yes. Um, since this is a two-tailed test and then the Z stat was positive, aren't you mm -hmm. supposed to do um, two and then in brackets one minus the table value? Um, you yes you you uh, yes you can do that. Uh, uh because it's a two-tailed test so this value that we have should be one of this value and that's what i'm saying so this it does not correspond to this value so we can also immediately from here you can also eliminate it because you need to say this value because it should be those ones you need to take this value and multiply it by two like we did there remember mm -hmm. Did I remove it? 
Yeah. Where for two tail value, we take both of them. So by looking at this value, it should be 0, 0,15. It's not 0, 0,15, it is 0, 0,024. So this means it will not yield that value. So that is our incorrect value. The others should be correct because our population standard deviation is known. So that should be correct. We're using a Z test. The null hypothesis is rejected at 5% level of significance. So it means we can say, remember the decision. So here we don't even have to worry a lot because the decision says, let me call this decision. The decision rule states that if the P value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. So our P value in this instance is 0, 0,03. I don't have to use the values that we are calculating now, but I just need to use the values we have there. And our alpha value is 0, 0,05. So our P value is less than. So we reject the null hypothesis and that's what it says. Now, and um, number D says the null hypothesis is not rejected at alpha of 1%. So alpha of 1% is that. So the p-value, we'll also need to change the sign. So the p-value here will be greater than. So we're not rejecting the null hypothesis. So here we'll say we do not reject the null hypothesis, which is correct. So the only option that is not correct there is number one because number one should have given us 0, 0,1 uh, 0, 0,015 or when we multiply it by two it should give us 0, 0,03 but it's giving us so if we multiply this by two it gives us 0, 0,048 okay in the exam you don't have to go through all the statements and all that just make sure that you can you are able to identify the things that you need for that purpose and move on because time is of essence that you must complete all the questions because you might be missing out when you get stuck on one question so in the exam don't do all options to try and verify all of them if you find the answer move on Now we're on a contingency table. So yeah, we actually almost closer to the end of the exam when you see another contingency table popping up. So this is chi-square. We're doing a test or a hypothesis for the relationship of two categorical variables. So also remember in the exam, if they didn't give you the totals on this one, they gave you the totals. If they didn't give you the totals, you need to go and calculate the totals. Otherwise, you know our, our famous Excel template, you can use the Excel template that we always use for doing the chi-square test. So you can also use that. Copy the values into that Excel. Look for the correct template. There are multiple templates. Look for the one that talks to the data that you are looking at. Okay. So this is a contingency table. What is the number of degrees of freedom? So yeah, the degrees of freedom for a contingency table is number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one now please be careful when you read the number of rows and when you read the number of columns do not read the total columns and rows do not read the header only read the input okay, this one and that one so you only need to read those ones not the total not the header
or the labels. So how many number of rows do we have? We have two. one, two. two. How many number of columns? Two. Oh, sorry. Two. Ah, there we go. Do not read this column and that column. How many number of columns do we have? We only have two. 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 I just said it now. Don't read the labels and the headers. Two. So one times one is equal to one. one. So the answer is... B. Now we know what the degrees of freedom is. We did calculate it. We found that the degrees of freedom is one. We need to go find the critical value. So a chi square of alpha and the degrees of freedom, we find it by using our alpha value. They gave us the alpha value of 1%, which is 0 0.01. 0 0.01. And the degrees of freedom is 1. We need to go to the critical values of chi table. And that is the critical values of chi. And we're looking for 1 and 0, 0, 0, 1. So you just use the the alpha value and one and you just come to the table and find it easy moving on okay on this one they also gave you the observed values which are your fo's and your expected values so you don't have to go and calculate the expected value in this one but I don't know in the exam whether they will give you questions like this. So if the mock exam resembles what the exam paper looks like, then EPO, EPA, you don't have to worry too much because then they've calculated the expected values. So you just substitute the values into the formula and work it out. But I will suggest also, because sometimes it's time consuming as well, you can use the template. Rewrite the, only the observed values onto that, uh, onto the template and only use a two by two table because this is a two by two. So if in the exam they give you a three by two, use the three by two. If they give you a four by four, you will have to sort it out yourself because I don't have a four by four. Um, but you just need to know and remember how to use the template. Um, I'm not sure if everyone has the template, but let's share the entire screen again. So this is the template that I am referring to, which is one of the other cheat sheets that you can use um, so we're doing a two by two. This is a two by two. And as you can see here on this template of ours, we've got pre-edit things. You don't have to use them. Uh, you, you must replace them with the correct information that you are using. Just want to open that uh, and minimize it a little bit. Miss Lizzie? Mm-hmm. Cheat. Cheat sheets is such a horrible word. It's called a visual aid. <laughs> oh, then you can use the visual aid. Uh, just want to make it also smaller. I can close this one because we know we've we're done using it. Okay. 
So there's so many things happening on my screen right now. Okay, I need to go to the two by two. So even in the exam, I'm not sure if you are able to minimize your exam thingy. You can minimize it. Or if you have two laptops, you can open two laptops. If you, because your, your exam, you don't use invigilator. So you must take this opportunity because next year, it might not be the same. Next year, if you're planning to write next year, they might use the invigilator app, the iris, all those things. So take this opportunity where you can write your exam freely and use it. Okay, so we're using the two by two. I'm just going to replace the values I have. I'm not going to worry about the labels for now because that will not affect my answer. I just need, and I'm only, if you notice, I'm only ca uh, capturing only those values because at the bottom, the table where it says expected values, all those expected values get captured there. And the only thing I need is the chi-square test statistic, and that is our chi-square test statistic that I, I'm So I've got my answer, which is, and it is in two decimals, so I can also just move it to two decimals. Is it two decimals or three decimals? It's in two decimals. So 11.228, which is that option. Hi, Elizabeth. How do we get this um, visual aid? Gang, S8. Hello? I'll post it on the chat. Hey, all right. It's a day. Hey, speak this way. Your fellow colleagues, your fellow students must send you the visual aid. There are two visual aids that we use. I can trace them to you guys or send them to you. Sorry, can you repeat that, please? Uh, I'm saying your fellow colleagues can email or send you or WhatsApp you the visual aid because. Um, you see now, oh, people are going, oh, people are going to, you see, that's why I don't like sharing my entire screen. Are you able to please put it in the chat for us? Uh, I will put it also on the chat. Some people can access the chat. Thank you so Let much. me get out of here because then. Yes, let's see. I will do that for you. Let me put it on the chat. You can go on. Oh, you will do that. Thank you very much, uh, Etienne. Um, I can't access the chat though. Yeah. Um, uh, Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll on the WhatsApp group. On the WhatsApp. We've sent it on the WhatsApp send group. It to you on your groups. Yes. Here we've got all the groups, so they will send it to you. Don't worry. You will I'll get it. it. I'll you put it on it. the group end here, so those guys will get it on Lizzie's WhatsApp group and share it with the other guys that are not on that group. Yeah. So they will share among themselves. Don't worry about that. Thank you, you will find a way. Okay. So. What did I do now? I stopped sharing. Lizzie? Yes. Can I ask that uh, the spreadsheet we were using in the first session as well be shared on the group? Ah, I closed that one. <laughs> I didn't save it. I will create one. Uh, but I didn't create, I didn't, I didn't save that one. I will we'll see we'll see what what else can we do okay so it's getting late let's finish up so we've got 22 and i think we left with one last question if I'm not mistaken, oh, two or three or more questions. How many questions are left? We're writing out of how many questions? 25. Okay, so we left with three questions. Okay, so th also this one uses the templates as well. So you can use the templates, but some questions you don't even have to worry about templates. 
So let's look at the question that we have here. So based on this information that we have, they've got scatter plot A, B, C, D, E, F. There are so many of them. And they're asking you to find, consider the sample data below and develop a scatter plot. Which one of the scatter plot A to F best describe the data? Because there are so many of them, and it says scatter plot B, scatter plot A, F. Uh, okay, F it's coming up twice. Okay, so D, E, F. Okay, and they are not in. In order, as you can see, A corresponds to scatter plot B, so you must also pay attention to those options. So let's look at the scatter plots. So we can take po uh, one point. Let's take the first one and see if we are able sorry, to make sense of it. Sorry, sorry, Lizzie, I'm not sure if it's on my side. I can't see your screen. Are you sure? We can see it. Yeah, we're good. It's appearing on my side. Yeah, we can see it. I can also see on screen. Yes, I can also see it. Okay, okay. maybe it's my, the problem from my screen. You can, you can go out and come back in. I'll take your network. <laughs> okay, so now we can take that Lizzie. first point and go look for it. Sorry, Lizzie. So it's, yes. I'm saying for this one, we can use the same method that we used for when we were doing the for the assignment. I can't even remember. We just what check the minimum. The we check the minimum and the maximum values, then we were eliminating. Oh, okay. So, yeah. okay. So we can do that. So what is the minimum value of this one? It's 14. What is the uh, so that will still work the same way, so it's fine. So if I take X of 14, so it should be somewhere, yeah, and Y of 17, it should be somewhere there. That can be true. There should be a point somewhere, somewhere here. For C and for this one, X 17, there is. Oh, okay, wait. Actually, let's even look at all this. Wait, I don't know. I, I'm so confused right now. Wait. Um, we can use that point X of, seven, of 14 and Y of 17. Yeah, this one does not even have 14 and 17. So we can just even ignore it because it starts at 20. And this one starts at, at 15, so it doesn't have 14. So you don't even have to worry about that one. This one actually starts at 20 uh, for X, uh, where is 14. There is no point that corresponds to 14x yeah so we can also eliminate that this one is a potential because 14 can be somewhere here and one of those values can be either one of them we can put the question mark there for now 14 and 17 and this one also it can be a potential but that is above Scatterplot E. Yeah, it's E. Scatterplot E. So, Miss Lizzie, what I did, what I did with this, and it's actually quite well for me, quite quick. If if you plot all those points in an Excel graph and you select them, and you just say insert scatterplot, it draws you exactly the dots that you're looking for. It's very very quick. Okay. Yes, that should well, be very good. Like yes, that. you can do that if you know how to use your your, your Excel. Mm. Uh, I'm looking at scatterplot E. Uh, that also can be correct. 
do we have any value of X that is more than 40? Yes, we do have 41. Do we have any value of X that is or Y? 10, 41 and 10. That is correct. Okay. And on this other one, that won't be correct. I, I pasted that Excel output on the chat if you wanted to look. Yeah. So D also is not correct. So E is the only one that I can also think of that can represent the data well, because this one doesn't have X of 40, should be somewhere there. And there are no values that for X that are more than 41. So this one, these two values can be correct. This one can be correct. So that can be correct. That can B can also be correct. Oh, but B started quick. Oh, get out of here. So this one, I'm gonna say E. So E. E corresponds with D. Scatter plot E. D is the option. Okay. Don't go and choose E from the answers because you need to look at the scatter plot title. Okay. Uh, question twenty four. It has all the summation values that they gave you and they're asking you to find the slope. So in this instance, the slope, there are formulas. So the slope, which is B1. Uh, so you can use the template on this one. So the slope is your sum of your X and Y minus the sum of X times the sum of y divided by n, divided by the sum of x squared, minus the sum of x squared, divided by n. Some, some uh, books or um, templates, they have B1 is your SSXY. Did they give the SSXY? No, they didn't. So you can use that because then that is the same as this. So the top part is sum of x and y over the sum of x, which is that. So you can use that. Some books in terms of n, they can just take this n and multiply it here. It still works the same way. They are represent one and the same thing. So you will still get the same answer whether you take n multiply by that. So let me look at your tutorial letter, the formula that you can use on here. Uh, on this one, it uses, oh, it uses this one way you can. Okay, we can also use that way we just divide by n, not here. We do the same. divide by n there, divide by n. So you just substitute the values that you have. So we are given, let's make it bigger. We are given all the values. There is your sum of y. One, one, five, oh, two. Oh, come on. One one five zero oh, two minus the sum of x four six five times sum of y six one three divided by n. Our n is the sample size, which is thirty. 
that is our n. Divide everything by the sum of x squared. It's 9, 4, 5, 5, minus the sum of x. You must pay attention to this. This is not sum of x squared. It's not that. It is the sum of x, which is 4, 6, 5 squared divide by 30. Zero comma eight nine. Zero comma five nine. I say zero. Eight nine. Eight nine. Eight nine. Zero comma eight nine. And that is option A. Hi, Leslie. Okay. Quick question. What happened to the 613? What happened to the 613? What 613? There next to 465. What happened to it? Yeah. Or oh, where did you calculate that all? Oh, that is the sum of X, the sum of Y. Here is your sum of Y. The sum of x. Okay. You just substitute into the formula. Okay. The values you get, you are given. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. So you just need to substitute into that formula. So you need to be able to identify the correct formula. So as you can see, all these formulas, there is nothing written on them that says what is what but you can use this to give you guidance because from that it's your sum of your sum square measures of x and y and if you look at that sum square measure of x and y that is that formula the sum square measure of x which is this and that is all what we use to substitute into b1 so when you calculate things like your R squared, also they will give you all these sum square measures. Your SSR is your B0 times the sum of Y plus B1 times the sum of XY minus the sum of Y squared N divided by SST, which is the sum of sum of Y minus that. So all these formulas, you can use them. So you just need to keep in mind. Lizzie. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry to disturb you, Lizzie. Uh, I've just joined the session now. Uh, if I may ask, uh, when are you going to upload this session uh, on my UNISA? Oh, on my UNISA, I will do it. OK, on my UNISA. Uh, on my UNISA, I will do session one, and then while this one is uploading on YouTube and all that, then I will, once it's done, I will upload it. So as the sooner we finish with the session, the, the sooner I will upload the sessions for you guys. Okay, thank you. So we are actually almost done. We... Sorry, sorry. Yes. Lucy? Yes. Are we are we going are we going to get both sessions on YouTube or we're gonna yeah, get one from my UNISA and one from no both of them are sorry one session one the earlier one is already on YouTube uploaded. Oh okay if, okay thank if, you. Yeah, if you subscribed, you should have already received the notification. Okay. Okay, thank so you. So even with this one, you will receive a sub a notification once I upload it. Okay. Right. right. Last, Thanks. last, last question. Last, last question. Then we can entertain any other questions outside of the session. Suppose the relationship for the store sales Y and the food traffic X is explained by this regression line of Y is equals to 6.64 plus 0, 0.8. 9x. So what you need to also remember here is this is your y hat is equals to your 
B0 plus B1X. You always need to remember that. With the coefficient of determination, R squared of 0, 0,6099. Which one of the following statement is incorrect? So with regression line, you need to be able to know how to estimate the value, how to interpret the slope, how to interpret the coefficient of correlation. And if you given the coefficient of correlation, how to find the coefficient of determination, or if you given the coefficient of determination, like in this instance, how to find the coefficient of correlation, which is R. So now, when interpreting the coefficient of determinant, which determination, which is R squared, we always say whatever percentage of the total variation, because this is a total variation in Y is explained by the variation, the variation in, in X. Sorry, in X. So in this instance, then it will be total variation in sales is explained by the variation in the food traffic, something like that. We can also take our R squared. In order for us to find the value of R, we just take the square root of R squared. That will give us our coefficient of correlation. And coefficient of correlation, we interpret it in terms of strength, and direction. Remember that? How we interpret the coefficient of correlation? We have a negative or a positive, uh, a negative, negative, positive, uh, a, a negative strong relationship. Strength is the negative direction. What am I talking about? Strength is either weak, moderate, or perfect. Direction is either negative or positive. That's how we interpret R. Interpreting the slope. For one additional unit increase or decrease in the value of this will increase or decrease in the value of that. So a one unit increase in value of X will have a impact in terms of a decrease or increase in the value of your Y. And that's how you interpret your slope. All right. And your slope also can give you the direction of your correlation, whether if it's negative, remember the slope. Let's go to the, our scatter plot, like this one. It, it's, it's on the scatter plot. It tells me that this is a positive, this is a negative. It gives me my direction. So therefore, it means on this one, my B1 is positive. On this one, the value of B1 is negative. So that's how you can know what direction your slope tells you. Okay. So now let's look at the statement. We need to choose the one that is incorrect. We are given R squared of 0, 0,6099. So how do we interpret it? 78% of the variation in sale is explained by the variation in the food traffic. Is that true? Incorrect. That is the incorrect one because it should have said zero comma. Yes. Oh, it should have said sixty point nine nine percent of the variation. Yes. So that is the incorrect one. In the exam, you are done. You close your session. You say yippee yeah yippee oh yippee yeah yeah yeah. You done. Pens down. When you get to the final question, but let's see if we can answer the rest of the question. So in terms of the slope, it's positive. So that is why that question says there is a positive linear relationship. 
when there is no traffic sale oh that's the other thing as well so remember if the um your x value is equals to zero so it means if we substitute this value with zero therefore our estimated y value in terms of sales our estimated sale will be or will increase by just or will just be 6,64 it will just be that value because this won't exist if x is zero so and that is what they are saying here but remember also this is the rent it's in thousands of rent so 6.64 times a thousand will give you 6,640. So how we interpret that when there is no food traffic in the store, that is a X is equals to zero, then the store will only sell online and the estimated sale for that store will just be 6,640 for when there are no food traffic. And that's how you interpret your y intercept d is the coefficient of correlation all you just need to do is what i just did there take the square square root of this value square root of 0 0.6099 should give you 0 0.7810 and that you can interpret it by saying there is a strong positive correlation between the store sales and food traffic. And that concludes our business of the day. Thank you very much and all the best for tomorrow. Let me stop sharing and unless Ms. if someone Liz, wants to ask a question. Miss Liz, could you please post this um, on YouTube because my laptop crashed about 20 minutes ago. So oh, yeah, no, quite a lot. Yeah, no, no. All, all of this will be will be on YouTube as well. All right. Thank you so much. OK, no problem. Any question? Other um, hello, Miss Elizabeth. Um, yes, I do have a question. Is it um, to the the mock exam? Is yes, it related to this. OK. No, um yes. the way you were the way you were doing like um showing the other lady in the previous one how to to use the casio i was following until on the x bar where you said we must press two that's when like below that i didn't know like how to go about uh finding the 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 the, 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 the last number so i was following the shift one four four division shift one four x bar two from there, going forward, I don't know how to do the, 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 the next step. Um, can I ask those who attend my sessions? Did I, in the notes, do I include the steps? I can't even remember. These things. Yes, you me. did. Uh, it, 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 there we go. Chapter. Yes. Let me just check. Yeah. I just so have I've to got... check which... Uh, no, I have only four. Oh gosh, that is not for Casio. Those are for. No, I don't have the steps for Casio. Okay, are... but at the end of the study guide, there is a information about two concreters, Casio and Sharp. Okay, ah, thank you. Watch the previous video yes. as well. Yes, no, you can also uh, use this document. You, uh, did, you did explain everything from the beginning till the end. Yeah, so you can use this document. Uh, I'm glad that they actually started using it. Uh, so you will get the steps for the Casio in the second column and the steps for the sharp calculator. So you will see that it also not only does the um, the stats but it also shows you how to work out like your factorials how to work out your univariate uh, you just need to go to the ones that are relevant to you um, the univariate stats which is this one so you should 
look at page 216 of your study guide um, <clears throat> on the steps on how to, to calculate the mean and the standard deviation, which is this. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so there are the steps to show you how to calculate the standard deviations. All right, all right, all right. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop recording and